Welcome, welcome, welcome. All are welcome in my father's house. And we got it. Have a chat right here like this. Come on, everybody.
something I haven't done since uh, I first began ministering, preaching the same sermon or teaching the same thing twice. You see, I had an executive decision pulled on me last week. Uh, my son announced to the congregation I'd have to teach the same message over again because we had many that were absent because of ice and snow. I don't know why they're absent today, because they thought, well, maybe we've heard it, we're not going to hear it again, I don't know. <laughs> but that's it. Uh, I'd like to make a couple points, announcements, before I actually begin. Uh, our family went to see the movie, Son of God, this week. If you haven't seen it, go. Now, you say, well, Pastor, I know the plot, I know the story. Sure you do. But it is refreshing over and over again to hear the story of Jesus, especially when it's put in a dramatic way with great acting. A man asked me when I left the theater. He said, well, do you think that was right, or theologically correct? I don't care. What do you mean you don't care? I don't. It presented Jesus. And it presented him in a glorious, realistic way, the acting superb. So, and we want to support Hollywood when it will support us. So be sure if you haven't seen it, go see it. And then Christmas, they're going to, uh, Easter, excuse me, Easter, they're going to have another production. And this is IMAX, they're going to do Noah. And we saw the uh, advertising for it. It's going to be tremendous. So you say, Pastor, you're telling us to go to a movie? Yes. <laughs> I remember the days when the preachers would have to slip out of town to go see a movie because people thought it was evil. But they went home and watched television and saw the same thing at home. Okay. We're beginning a series. We began last week and we're repeating it to some degree. I never can teach the same thing twice. But it's on the family. And I have been elected by my staff to teach on fatherhood. So we invite you to turn to our text, a very short text in the book of Proverbs. In fact, it's one verse, Proverbs 13, verse 22. I'm waiting to hear pages rustle. You ought to have your Bible. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man or righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wrath of the sinner is stored up for the righteousness. The wealth of the sinner. I'm not going to preach on that last part because one is conditional upon the other. The wealth of the sinner is not laid up except for the inheritance of a good man. A righteous man leaves an inheritance. Now, when I say that, most of you think immediately, well, pastor's going to talk about money. No, I'm not. That's not the inheritance I'm talking about. I'm talking about the inheritance of a father. What a father leaves to a family. These statistics came from the Washington Post. 15 million United States children. That's one in every three live without a father. They're being raised in a single parent home. Though income is the primary factor Nevertheless, this is an overwhelming problem in the black community. I'm quoting from the Washington Post. And one of the reasons I'm so concerned about that is I have been concerned about race relations from the beginning of my ministry. And it's hurting the African American community. The census show that 54% 
of children in the black community live with only a mother without a father. 12% of the black families below the poverty line have two parents present, compared with 41% of impoverished Hispanic and 32% of poor white families. The major problem is not the poverty. The major problem is the lack of dads. Now let me say something. Spreading a seed does not make you a father. Some men are like farmers that go out with baskets full of seed and start throwing it all over the place. It may produce some crop, but it doesn't produce bread. It doesn't produce an inheritance. And the first inheritance I want to talk about is a spiritual inheritance. Not a financial one, a spiritual inheritance. Turn to me to Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts chapter 16. There's a scripture in here that I love and have repeated over and over again. Beginning with verse 25, the story is Paul and Silas are in prison. And while they're there in prison, well, let's read it. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now the reason he was about to do that under Roman law, he was responsible for their time in prison. And if they got out, he had to fulfill the prison. And if he, they were crucified, he had to get crucified. So you imagine the terror that this man was having. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do not yourself any harm. They're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling for Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Of course, they want to be saved from the Romans, but when they ask a question like that, you give a spiritual answer. I remember being in a group one day and the building was pretty full. (laughs) And a man came in and he said, asked one of the students of Bible college, he said, is that seat saved? And the Bible student said, no, but are you? I take any opportunity. What must I do to be saved? So he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to them and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same night, hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he brought them into the house, he set food before them and rejoiced having believed God in, with all his household. Now, what does it take to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Well, what else must I do? That's it. Well, now, now, understand each culture has a tradition. The American tradition came from the great awakening evangelist. Walk down the aisle and tell the pastor, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and then you can be saved. Well, I was saved in my automobile. I didn't walk down an aisle. Well, preacher, you're not saved. No, I, no, 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 no. I debate that question with you that you don't have to receive it the way I did. You don't have to have a Damascus Road experience. You just have to know in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and he'll take care of the rest. But here's what I wanted to add to it. And your family. Now, 
Now, Pastor Paul, are you telling me that the family of every Christian is going to be saved? No. God doesn't have grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But dad, the best thing you can ever do for your children is to find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because it changes the dynamics of the household. It will do that. I want you to know that. Now these family, the wife and children, accept it right then. Others it may delay. <laughs> Good gracious. I was a minister for 10 years before my wife received Christ. That shows you how poor a preacher I was. <laughs> but no. The fact of it is, if you're a Christian father, you have a right to claim this scripture. I'm going to talk about prayer in just a moment, but one of my prayer, I don't worry about my children or my grandchildren. You say, you don't? No. Because when I pray, I say to God, Father, your word says you and your household. And though they go astray and though they wander and though they're like prodigals, they will come back. They will be saved. Why? Because I'm a righteous man and I walk in the integrity of God. And that means because I am, my children will receive this inheritance. They will know Jesus. I know I'm off the subject somewhere I was going, but it's still there. It's when uh, Mary Jane Roberts married Paul Willis. And I was Mormon. People came to her mother and said, Ruby, Paul's gonna marry, uh, Mary's going to marry that Mormon boy? She said, don't worry about it. I've talked to God about it. Paul will know Jesus. And he will serve him. Well, Ruby, how can you say that? Because I'm a Christian and I believe it. And I've made a covenant with my God. And that's the way it'll work. And she made that covenant, her and her husband, about every single child and grandchild she had. And every single one of them gave their life to Christ and served him. You see, there's, there's an authority in a home. And God honors that authority. Now, a non-Christian won't pray for their children that way. But a Christian father will. And he'll say, God, your word says right here, Paul said, you and your household, and I believe my household will know Jesus. But there's got to be a father image in the home. I had three friends that were very close to me in high school. More than three, but these three particular. Neither one of these boys had a daddy. He said, well, sure, they had it. No, they didn't have one. We called them by a bad name, but they didn't have daddy, or people called them by bad names. They didn't know who their daddy was. Jim, he lived right next door to my wife's family. He had no righteous father to copy the last time I saw Jim, I was a youth pastor of a church in Moorhead City. And we had a bus with young teenagers, and some of them were girls. And we went into a shop where they sold hamburgers and Coke and so forth. But they also sold beer there. And there were a number of drunk guys there, and they started making sexual remarks and, at my teenage girls. Jim was there. He stood up. He says, cut that out. Stop it right now. He says, that's Paul Willis. He's my pastor friend, and you won't talk that way in front of him. No, they shut up because they knew Jim would have a fight right then. But Jim was an alcoholic. Oh, I witnessed to him. But he died an alcoholic without Christ. 
tragic, broke my heart. But why, Pat? He had no father image, none whatsoever. He had nothing to lean on. Now, Chris never got the chance. Chris was a great guy. His mother was a prostitute. Some of you are shocked when I say that, no. She worked at a brothel on Atlantic Beach, and unfortunately, the brothel was owned by one of my uncles. Chris never did well in school. Neither did I, so I'm not judging anything, but he had no father image, and the moment he finished high school, he was drafted in the army, went to basic training, and was killed two weeks after he got to Korea. Then there was Bobby. Bobby lived right behind me. He never knew a father. His mother was, well, I won't call her or what she was, but we were, he was embarrassed to have us over to the house because she would always walk around in her underwear in front of his friends. Bobby had no father image, no inheritance. He followed me in the Air Force. He enlisted two weeks after I did. Bobby ended up hanging himself by his neck right outside of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Picked up on a morals charge. I don't look at those boys that way. I grew up with them. I saw what was wrong in their life is they had no father. They had no male image to copy. They had no one to look up to. They had no one to direct their life at all. A father is better than no father. Now turn with me to the book of Proverbs, the 20th chapter, verse 7. Wisdom of Solomon. Proverbs 20, verse 7. Don't look so glum. There's good news here. But I'm on dad some today. The righteous man walks in his integrity. Not only saved, but walking in your integrity, dad. You leave an example of honesty. You leave an example of fidelity in front of the children. You leave an example of love and parenting. You walk in your integrity. And when you do, listen, it's a promise. And his children are blessed after him. You walk in your integrity and in your righteousness and your children and your children's children will be blessed because of it. You don't walk in righteousness. You don't walk in integrity. You don't walk in morality and your children will be cursed. Uh, here's an example I've used before, but it's really powerful. A.E. Winsett decided to check the descendants of two men. This is at the beginning of the 20th century. The men were born in the same location, had the basic same background. One of the men was Jonathan Edwards. He became the father of the great awakening of America, winning souls to Christ. The other was Mac Jukes. Max Jukes ended up in prison. Here's what happened to their children. Of Jonathan Edwards, his children and children's children, produced one United States vice president, three United States senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries. All from one man who walked in integrity. Well, about, about Jukes, oh, he had in his descendants, seven murderers, 60 thieves, 
50 women prostitutes, 130 convicts, 310 paupers living in the poorhouse, 400 physically wrecked by indulgent listing. Even in Jews' day, it estimated that the state of New York paid more than $1,250,000 on his descendants in prison. What's the difference? Jukes and Edwards. Edwards walked in the integrity of God and Jukes followed after the way of Satan. And it influenced the generation after the generation after the generation. Now, it's not only being born again, Dad. It's having the Word of God in your home and in you. Now, when I say in your home, I don't mean sitting on the coffee table and I don't mean under the TV. I mean being used in your home. The book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, the third verse. Turn with me there. Deuteronomy 6, 3. Therefore hear, O Israel, be careful to observe it, that it may be well for you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God your fathers has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord of one. You shall love the Lord God with your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. First place. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be frontless between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. What? Surround the whole house with the word of God. Now I didn't have that privilege when I was growing up. That wasn't there. But then I met the Roberts family. Mary's mother had a special room built on her house just for her prayer room. Had jealous windows on each side. I can hear her right now and see her in there. Had a religious wallpaper on the wall. Had her chair and had a lamp and had her little stand right there. And there was her Bible. And it didn't stay on that stand. It was open. I took a photograph of her one day, and Mary still got it, I guess, and she had a white net scarf over her head, and she's got her Bible open like that, and her white hair bent. She's studying her Bible. Oh, yeah. And Mr. Roberts had his chair, like I've got mine, lounge chair, and right next to it was the Bible. And they didn't stay closed. They both knew those scriptures. They both knew that word. And they would both put that word at you. And they would both pray those words. They knew them. Why? That's what God instructed, that you just have the word of God and saturate your home with it. Then you'll pray the word of God. You say, well, prayer, prayer, prayer is always important if you're praying and listening, but you can waste your breath in prayer too because God will only act according to his word. Now, in the, old, in the New Testament book of Philippians, the fourth chapter, the apostle Paul writes about prayer. He says, be anxious for nothing. Woo. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And, the and means this will happen. The peace of God, which suppresses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything where praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, those two things go together, the prayer and the meditation. Think about the good things and praise God. Mm. If you're praying correctly, what will happen? It's the peace of God, which will pass understanding, will come in your heart. 
I, I haven't been concerned about my kids. Pastor, don't you worry? Nope, never have worried about them. You haven't? Nope, never worried about them. Well, I had one that rebelled real big time. I mean, he rebelled, rebelled, rebelled. And my dear wife would say, honey, go find him. Well, I knew I couldn't. So I didn't know the kind of places he went to. I didn't go there. But I, to peace her, make her peace, I would drive the car out a couple doors down and stop, turn off the lights and turn on the radio and wait a while, come back home. I couldn't find him. And I'd pray. But I was always praying God's word. I knew enough to pray God's word. God, you said me and my household. There will no disaster take, overtake my children or my children's children. They will not, Father, because I bring my, your word before you and you keep your word. <laughs> Dennis would have me share this or not, but I will. One night, some of his buddies sent him out to get a load of drugs. Dennis. Yeah, he had a van. It smelt like a factory when he came down the road. <laughs> so they sent Dennis out to get it. And I mean, it was hard stuff. So Dennis went out there and he had it all in his van. He started to pull in to the house where the people were waiting and when he stopped the car, a pistol came through the window. And the agent said, son, where are you going? Dennis said, up there to visit. He said, well, this is a drug raid. We're looking for drugs. And if I were you, I'd back out of here and get away. Because we're raiding that place. And said, yes, sir. Backed out. They didn't find the drugs. You know why? He had them all. <laughs> now, Dennis has told us since then, he said, Dad, you and Mama's prayers were working. Oh, God, were they working. They were working. I said, that boy's not going to jail. He's not going to be in trouble. He's not going to do that. He's going to come out of that. Now, I, I, and fussing at him wouldn't do any good. I knew that. I walked right where in the room he had, and he was renting a place, and sat down at his living room table, and drugs were on the coffee table, and never said a word to him about it. Why, well, Pat? It wouldn't, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have helped him. It wouldn't help. I just loved him. And I said, every time I walked out, Father, my son, I'm righteous in you through the blood of Christ, protect him, bring him out of it, according to the Word of God. That's part of a father's inheritance. He needs to do that. So there's a prayer inheritance. Now there's also a social inheritance. What do you mean a social inheritance? The lifestyle of the house they're living in. The book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 25th verse. I know others are going to mention this in this series, but listen. Husband, love your wife as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But he should be holy without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it as the Lord of the church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to him with one wife. And the two shall be one flesh. The father relationship in the home. The wife relationship. Book of Colossians, the third chapter, goes right along with it. The 19th verse. Husband, love your wife and do not be bitter towards them. Have a peaceful, loving environment in the home. 1 Peter 3, 7. 
I'm giving these a little faster because I need to move on to some other things. I want you to see it. Husband, likewise, dwell with them as understanding, giving honor to the wife as the wicker vessel and being heirs together in the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. What's it mean? Dad, he's going to treat his wife like he sees you treat yours. If there's peace in your house, there'll be peace in his when he gets married. If you're fighting and scrapping and hollering and yelling at one another and throwing things at one another, don't tell me. I've been around pastor long enough. I know what goes on. That's what's going to be in your son and your daughter's home. They're going to pattern after you. It's not something they intend to do, but it's part of being a father. You, you begin to pattern those things. And if you give honor, they'll give honor. Love your wife more than you love yourself. Huh? Yeah. And you show it. You show it by the way you treat her. We had a couple in this church. Don't guess they're not here actively. He was so tight fisted. Eagles squawked. They went out on their 50th wedding anniversary. And he went out to take her to dinner. And he had the puppy dog in the back of the car so he didn't want to leave it there alone. And he drove up to the restaurant and said, you stay here with the puppy dog. And he went in and stayed and stayed. And when he came out, he was sucking the bone. And he had a doggy bag for the puppy dog. This is the 50th anniversary and he didn't even bring her a thing to eat. Some of you shot. Pastor, that's, that's the way we are. He said, Harley, I bought you a diamond. She said, oh, wonderful. He said, yeah, I got it for 50 cents, a piece of glass. She threw it out the window. He, he got upset because she threw it out the window. Now, anything he wanted, he got for himself. Oh, yeah. He took care of himself, but nothing for her. Look, guys, you get the greatest honor when you honor her more than anyone else. No, 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 no. You get the greatest honor. A long time in ministry, especially in other churches, we were about starved to death, couldn't do anything, but we finally got enough money head. I said, Mary, we got enough so we can buy you a car. What kind you want? She went down and picked out one. Nice one. Well, I made a mistake the first time, but I went back and bought it. I got the right one for her. That's the one she wanted. Some of you look at me. You, I'm not wealthy. I'm wealthy, but not rich, Okay. Wealthy's having all your bills paid for. One day she says to me, honey, you know, I would really like a car now that when I get in the morning and sit down, that seat, that leather seat, so cold, uh, and, and, and your truck's got a heater in it. And my truck, push a button in it, it'll warm your backside. It's got a heater under the seat. She said, I'd like that. I said, Okay. So we're driving back from another city, and I passed this place. I said, have you ever seen a Lexus? She said, no. I said, mm, one of the finest cars ever built. Come on. And we went in and looked at it. She told the man, said, I don't see anything here I want. She, he said, well, what would you want? She said, well, I, I'd like a white one. And I like tan leather inside. I want a heated seat on mine. I'd like to have a satellite radio on it. And then she named some other things she'd like. He said, well, ma'am, I can get that for you. I, know where, I, 
got right back here. And not only has the seat got heat in it, it's got air conditioning in the seat too. And it gets hot, it'll, it'll cool her backside. <laughs> Pastor, you didn't buy her that? Yeah, she's that little old blonde-headed lady that drives that thing only on Sunday to church and to the grocery store. Why do you drive a pickup truck? I'm still paying for mine. Why would you do that? She's my wife. I want to honor her. I want the best for her. Some of you guys looking at me, mm, 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 mm. don't say things like that. No. <laughs> Had nothing to do with this message. Nothing whatsoever. But just yesterday, for example, I came down and worked in this church a few minutes, a little while, spent some time prayer. Decided I liked some fruit, so I went to one of the stores that's supposed to have it. They only had apples and a few oranges, and not what I wanted. I wanted cherries and plums. But anyway, went over there, picked me up a chocolate drink, hot chocolate protein, like chocolate. And they were putting out spring flowers. And I walked over and I looked around at them. I said, Mary liked them. And she likes the planted ones. I don't know if she'd like those. A lady came up to me and she said, are you interested? And she was putting them in water. I said, yes, what's the best ones you've got? Well, this big bouquet, oh yeah, that's the ones I want. And I know somebody, what have you done wrong, preacher? Nothing. <laughs> she was telling lady at our house, Donna, she says, uh, Paul, when we were in the Air Force, brought me a bouquet of yellow tulips. I'll never forget it. A dozen yellow tulips. And all the ladies said, he's done something wrong. He went out with somebody. He's done something wrong. No. Beauty's worth its price. Hello. Beauty is worth its price. And you honor beauty by giving beauty. Hello, guy. And what will happen? Your sons and your grandchildren will learn the same pattern. Right, Lana? Right. Oh, because they're going to learn to appreciate and honor. Oh, let me move on. Then there's the physical. And I don't mean by physical sex. Turn to Proverbs 18.9. The physical relationships, Proverbs 18, verse 9. This is all legacy. This is what you all leave in legacy. Remember, I preached this when I taught it last Sunday, so I'm just being a little slower. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him that's a great destroyer. What do you mean? The lazy man is a brother to the devil. Whoa, pastor. The lazy man is a... Br no, 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 no. Well, you don't understand. I know, I don't. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. The ninth verse. Live joyfully with the wife whom you live, love all the days of your life, which he has given you under the sun all the days of vanity, for that's your portion of life and the labor you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Why? Because there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. Do it now. Mister, you're not going to like this. When you get married and you produce a seed, I hope you're married, don't produce seeds unless you are. When you're married, produce a seed. You're responsible economically for her and all the seed. Amen. Well, 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 wait, 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 she works. That's a gift to you, not a requirement. The man's job is to provide for his family. I know I'm old-fashioned, but I want to tell you something else I mentioned last week. You may not have ever stopped and figured it, but your wife's work could cost you money. What? 
Mary and I decided it a long time ago. We went over this pretty thoroughly. If I had to, in the old days, buy her a car to carry her to work, then I have to buy gas to get her there. Then I have to buy a dress and stuff that dress her up so she'll look good at the job, so she can hold the job and do that, you know. And then she'll have to pay for lunch on the job. And then we have to buy child care for after school. She don't make enough money for me to pay that, especially if I paid somebody to do what she does around the house. It's more valuable for her to be home than it was out at work. That's not true in every family, but that was true in ours. Besides, I'd rather have her taking care of our kids than somebody else doing it. But I'm responsible to do everything I can do to provide for the children and her. How long, some of you are going to ask? It never ends. <laughs> it never ends, friend. I just want to know, well, well, when they get old, no, when they get older, they get more expensive. Well, how about the grandchildren? You still have, a, you still have a obligation for the grandchildren. Mm -mm. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, the 10th verse, for when we were with you, we commanded this, if anyone not work, neither will he eat. We hear there's some, some among you who are disorderly, not working, but busybodies. Now, any of those who are such, we command, exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. I found this to be absolutely true. When a man loses his job, he loses his dignity, he loses his self-worth, he loses his uh, a position, and he ends up being a busybody. Woman, same way. Worst thing can happen to man's retirement. It'll kill him. What? Well, what about if I retire? Get another job. Get, get another, something else to do. Get something else that gets you enthused. Get you something else. Don't lay around that house all day eating popcorn or whatnot, watching one of them old movies. It'll kill you. Well, I got the checks coming in from retirement. And I think, forget the checks. It will kill you. Get out there and do something. Hey, I can say that. I'm 81 and I'm still working. And I'm finding new careers all the time. Now I want to give you two more scriptures, then we'll close it. These two, I, I, I can't miss not giving them to you. Psalm 127. Mm. And then we're going to pray. Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, that means pay attention. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like ours in the hand of a warrior, so children in one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You know what it means in the gate? The gate of the town of Jerusalem was the place of honor. And the children will honor the father in the gate. Mm-mm-mm. Proverbs 17, 6. One more and I lose. Hang on. I promised you. One more. Proverbs 17, 6. Listen to this. Line it up. Children's children. Grandchildren. A crown of old men. And the glory of the children is their father. Children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of the children is their father. When the children come over to the house, And I'm sitting on my throne, Mary calls it, my recliner. 
I mean, a 40-year-old grandson will come get in my lap and kiss me on the cheek and say, Papa, how you doing? I miss seeing you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing like it. Oh, the little one's great-great-grandchildren do the same because they've seen their daddies do it. My granddaughters come over. Whew. Oh, they're beautiful. Oh, they're so pretty. Ah. One of them brought a boyfriend over the other day, and I told him I had a gun. <laughs> but they'll come in, and they hug me and kiss me. Their crown, their glory, and that's my glory. A righteous man, a good man, leaves an inheritance. You ever think about it, what kind of inheritance you want to leave? What do you want your name to known, be known about? Well, I have over the years, and it's changed. First, I wanted to be Billy Graham, be an evangelist that won millions to Christ. Been nice, but that's not it. What if a man gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Mm -mm. Well, you'll be known as the pastor who started and built the cathedral of his glory. Oh, that's going to fall. Not right now, but it will one day fall and decay. It's going to. But to have my grandchildren walk with honor and smile and say, my papa was Paul Willis. <laughs> my papa was Paul Willis. My daddy is Paul Willis or Dennis Willis. Or... Oh, yeah. That's the inheritance of a righteous man. That's the greatest inheritance you can live. Now, I'm going to give an invitation. Same one I gave last week. You see, Abraham laid his hands on Isaac and on Jacob, who became Israel, and passed down a father's blessing. What I want to do for the invitation is invite the fathers. Now, if you're not a married man, you've got a dozen, forget it. You just spread seed. You're not a daddy. But if you're a father, I want you to stand on your feet, come to this altar, and let me pray for you and lay hands on you that you'll leave an inheritance, that you'll be the kind of daddy that will make your children and your grandchildren proud of your name because of who you are in them.